the archives of football's rich history that there exists a chapter that speaks of a position lost to time. A position that doesn't fit your necessary archetype of a defender. Sure, you have your center backs, full backs, and even occasional sweepers. But throughout the generations, there remains an incredibly unique position that, since its first inception with the great Franz Beckenbauer, has now altogether died out. A role known no other as the libero. And the last of this unique and extinct breed was truly Laurent Blanc, a linchpin capable of thwarting and igniting the attack, bridging the gap between defenders, midfielders, and even forwards. Because while many remember Ronald Koeman as a great goal-scoring defender, they forget that this defensive unicorn was the fourth highest goal-scoring defender of all time being both an integral and irreplaceable part of his clubs, not only winning trophies in every top league he played for, but also helping his country achieve absolute footballing greatness. So sit tightly as we entangle the story of Laurent Blanc, a defender who was so special, he became the last of the true liberos and an almost extinct memory of the beautiful game. It all started in the picturesque village of Rizon, at the incredibly young age of 13 years old, his remarkable abilities earn him a spot in the French Division II Youth Academy of Olympique de Alès, where the youngster would show prowess in scoring goals, dribbling the ball, and playing defense. He was so impressive that at the age of 15, he would make the jump to the Youth Academy of eventual Ligue 1 club Montpellier. His managers thought so highly of him that immediately after turning 18, he was moved up to the first team and directly thrown into the starting 11. And keep in mind this is when the club was still in the French second division, just having been relegated after only a single season in the top flight, historically being either a second division club or continuously being in the relegation zone year after year. So you might think it's crazy for a club with ambitions to continuously feature in the pinnacle of French football to rely on a teenager so heavily. But that's because Laurent Blanc had a very unique set of skills. He would begin his career as a midfielder and, more specifically, if you could actually believe it, as an attacking midfielder, nonetheless. But what made him special or unusual for the role was his incredible lack of pace. But to offset that disadvantage, he was an incredibly gifted and technical player. And despite his young age, even more so than his veteran teammates, Blanc was an incredibly cool and calm player, always wearing a poker face and relentlessly working hard on both ends of the pitch. Yes, even as an attacking midfielder, he was like a horse who lacked pace, constantly fighting for possession and making plays. And his work rate was absolutely insane for his position, always running back and fighting for possession in the bottom third, then going on to set up the play for establishing the attack. On top of it all, he was a smart player who would rarely ever make reckless plays. Plus, his large frame at 6'4 or 192 centimeters gave him a dominant stature and made him a constant set-piece threat. Truly, as he first stepped onto the pitch as an 18-year-old, Laurent Blanc was a unicorn on the pitch. A large player with seamlessly endless stamina, who played as a smart attacking midfielder with incredible work rate in both regaining possession and mounting the attack. It's easy to see why there would eventually be no other player like him since. And it was on his third season that Blanc would absolutely break out, bringing Montpellier some of the best success it's ever seen in its entire existence. As in the 1986-87 season, he would go on to score 20 goals in 36 appearances, helping his club finish at the top of the second division into finally winning promotion back to Ligue 1. However, life would throw Blanc a curveball. He would tear his left thigh and receive a few other minor injuries that would sideline him for nearly an entire year. But miraculously, in 1988, he would make a triumphant return, playing for France in the under-21 Euros, where he would help his team dominate the midfield and come out of the tournament as the under-21 champions of Europe, with Blanc ending the tournament being named the under-21 Euros Golden Player. But due to his injury, he had lost even more pace and thus had to slightly change his playstyle. And that was when then-manager Michel Mezzi would make a revolutionary change to Blanc's career, moving him to play at the very unique position of libero. He figured Blanc was already playing everywhere on the pitch, both defending and attacking all match long, as an attacking midfielder, I remind you. So why not just play him lower on the pitch and replace his position with a more suitable attacking player? Moving Blanc to this incredibly unique role did not only naturally align with his already special style of play, but enhanced it even further. 
But you might ask, what is a libero? Many might think it's the same position as a sweeper. However, the two are slightly different. A sweeper is much more common and used in more prevalent traditional defensive formations. While the role of a libero originated in the 1930s Swiss Domestic Football League, it gained popularity in Italian football and was used to describe an evolved and nuanced version of the sweeper. Historically, a sweeper plays a more straightforward defensive role, primarily focusing on clearing loose balls and ensuring defensive stability. Sweepers were often the last line of defense, positioned just behind the center backs, having to sweep up or clear any threats that breach the defensive line. A libero, on the other hand, is a more dynamic and multifunctional role. While they still perform defensive duties, they are also involved in playmaking, initiating attacks, and distributing the ball with greater precision. For sweepers, defense is a priority and playmaking responsibilities are secondary. While sweepers might distribute the ball and have a few chances to playmake, what they're concerned with most are defensive threats. Liberos, however, add tactical flexibility to a team's formation, allowing for unique variations in defensive strategies based on the flow of the game. Liberos can execute build a play from the back and link up with midfielders and even forwards to maintain possession, control the pace of the game, and join in on the attack. A true libero needs incredibly elite tactical awareness to understand when to stay back and defend, when to push forward, and when to contribute to the team's overall strategy. There's times when they might need to be defensive all game, and likewise, times when they have to continuously switch between the roles depending on the squad's ability, play style, or situational need. While for sweepers, involvement in the attacking play is often limited, or more realistically, on most occasions, not needed or used at all. Liberos often act as deep-lying playmakers, initiating attacks, distribute the ball to intelligently launch offensive transitions and counterattacks, or single-handedly bring the ball up and start the attack all by themselves. And this is how they differ greatly from defensive midfielders. Some of you can argue that Luka Modric at times plays as a libero, which I would say is a pretty decent example in the modern game. However, Modric will more often than not play like a midfielder instead of a true libero. But what makes liberos so special is that they have the skill set of a highly intelligent playmaker and goal scorer, but are just so tactical and effective on the defensive end as well, with incredibly high work rates and elite technical ability. And arguably the most iconic legend to ever play the role of libero is no other than the great Franz Beckenbauer. But with such a unique and specific skill set, the position has mostly become extinct in today's game. But this change in Blanc's positioning opened up so much possibility for his club to only improve. Because in his first season, playing this role after missing out on a year to injury, and after having just helped his club advance to the first division two seasons prior, Blanc as a libero would only further add to his team's overall defensive effectiveness and attacking production. Scoring 16 goals in 40 appearances while helping his historically weak club finish third in the French Division 1 table only 6 points away from winning the title. Then the very following season, after adapting more to the role, he would produce 17 goal contributions in 49 matches, bringing Montpellier their first piece of silverware since 1961, an insane 29-year trophyless drought when he would help his club win the 1989-1990 Coup de France while being named the 1990 French player of the year. Blanc's incredibly special position and style of play, clubs from all over Europe's top five leagues want him on their squad. He would be signed for Napoli in Serie A, then go back to France to play a few seasons with clubs like Saint-Étienne before his talents would be recruited by the great Johan Cruyff himself, and he would be signed by FC Barcelona. However, unfortunately, Cruyff would soon be sacked following his signing, and Blanc would once again suffer a string of minor injuries throughout the season that would leave Barca just two points behind Real Madrid for the league title. But he would still make a big enough impact to help his club win the Spanish Super Cup in the beginning of the season and was a big factor in winning the UEFA Cup Winners' Cup in the mid-stages before his injury. But the 1998 World Cup was slowly approaching, and Blanc wanted to have enough time to recover and give his absolute best for his nation. And thus, he would choose to play closer to home in Marseille, when the club was at one of its lowest points in history, immediately being named captain upon his signing. And there, he would slowly begin to gain the nickname of Le Président 
because it was at Marseille that he would really show his commanding and charismatic leadership on top of his decisive playmaking on both ends of the pitch, where he would lead his dying Marseille squad back to life, even almost winning the league title and making it all the way to the UEFA Cup, or unfortunately losing to Parma. But now it was time for the 1998 World Cup, where it was in playing for his country that Blanc truly did give his utmost all, as Blanc would score the game-winning goal against Paraguay in the round of 16, and was absolutely crucial on both sides of the pitch, stopping an onslaught of attacking chances from Italy, and even scoring the game-winning penalty as well, in the quarterfinal of what would easily be the most difficult match for the French squad in the tournament. However, in the semi-final versus Croatia, Blanc would get the first and only red card of his entire career, but France would eventually lift the World Cup trophy after a comfortable 3-0 win against Brazil in the final, without a doubt being one of the most important players in the squad. I mean, there's a reason why he was named France's fourth best player of the century, considering how many French footballing legends there are not only throughout history, but even in his squad and generation alone. With only Michel Platini, Zinedine Zidane, and Raymond Copa finishing above him. But after World Club glory and rejuvenating Marseille from the brink of relegation zone quality, he would play a couple of seasons with Inter Milan, where he was even named the club's player of the season in 2000. Then that very same summer, despite his older age, he would give his last effort for France in the 2000 European Championships, scoring a goal against Denmark and playing incredible defense, winning him his last and final major international trophy. And finally, during the very last few seasons of his career, he would be recruited by no other than Sir Alex Ferguson himself, as his role was the perfect fit for Man United's system, helping them finish the 2002-03 season with the best defense in the league and fewest goals conceded, winning the Premier League title, before he would be replaced by an up-and-coming Rio Ferdinand and finally deciding to hang up his boots. And throughout his entire career, this unicorn of a player shows why he indeed was the last of the true liberos. A player at his size, with his insane work rate, incredible eye for goal, and impeccable technique, mixed in with truly elite defense and defensive positioning, has rarely been seen in the game at all since. I mean, come on, when was the last time you heard of an attacking midfielder playing a defensive role, still managing to score over 150 career goals, not just from mostly penalties, but actually going up there and scoring, all while still doing everything in between and making your way back down to stop the opposition attack. As Le President left the pitch with his retirement, so seemingly did the position of Libero follow him as well. And I can only hope that one day there will come another who can revive it and show us just how unique and beautiful this forgotten style of play can really be.